Welcome back everyone, it is me, Matmus. Thank you so much for being here today, I really appreciate you stopping by. We are talking about depleted uranium ammunition today on tanks, and I want to make something very clear before we proceed. This video is not going to be discussing the controversial topics about the ammunition in regards to health effects, etc. I know there is already some very healthy debate on this kind of ammunition being used, and if you wish to discuss that in the comments section, you're more than welcome to, but it's not going to be the primary focus of this video today. I'm more going to be focusing really in on the specifications of the ammunition, its history, and how it came to be. So the use of depleted uranium as a penetrator really has resulted in some of the most superior armament for tanks across the battlefield. The tank is the primary offensive weapon in any army and nations normally compete to field the best tanks in both peace and war. The same thing applies for the ammunition being fired from them. In the 1980s, the US Army took a drastic step of arming its tank, the beautiful M1 Abrams, with the ultimate upgrade. A tank killing round made of, yes, you guessed it, uranium, the heaviest naturally occurring element on Earth. The result is an unmatched tank killer capable of destroying just about any fielded tank armor. The M1 Abrams tank was first fielded by the US Army in the 1980s. The Army had preferred the 105mm gun, the British designed Royal Ordnance L7, also known in the United States as the M68. The M68 had armed the M60 series of tanks for decades and was considered a proven good enough gun. The M1's turret could only accommodate 55 rounds of the 105mm ammunition, a reduction from the 62 rounds the older M60 tank could carry. An even larger gun would further reduce the ammo capacity to a mere 40 rounds. Pentagon officials on the other hand wanted to equip the M1 with the larger German-designed Rheinmetall M256 120mm smoothbore gun. The civilian leadership felt obliged to use the gun in part way to offset German participation in the NATO AWACS program. A larger gun would also future-proof the M1, allowing it to defeat future tanks with heavier armour. A compromise resulted in which the M1 would be initially manufactured with the M68 gun, but would be upgraded to the M256 at a later date. Moreover, a later version of the tank, later called the M1A1, would come standard with the larger M256. While the tank was now future-proofed, the point about the small ammunition capability stood still. The fire control system on the M1 was so advanced that it could hit a moving target at 2,000 meters with a 90% accuracy kill ratio. The problem was not going to be misses and wasted ammunition, but ensuring that hits translated into actual kills. At the same time, the United States was researching the use of depleted uranium as an armor penetrator. A byproduct of nuclear reactor fuel, depleted uranium was harder and denser than existing tungsten tip penetrators. Accelerated to extremely high speeds, this allowed depleted uranium really to smash through just about any kind of amount of armor. The nature of uranium and steel would cause DU to catch fire upon penetration, causing catastrophic damage inside the enemy tanks. The standard tungsten anti-armor round for the M60 tank, the M735, could penetrate 350mm or 13.7 inches of steel rolled homogeneous armor or RHA. The standard measurement for armored vehicle protection. The M833 DU round however could penetrate 420mm of RHA positioned at 60 degree angle for maximum armor thickness. By comparison, the larger Soviet 125mm gun on the T-72 tank could penetrate 450mm of armor. Most importantly, the M774 could penetrate the T-72's frontal hull and turret armor where the armor was thickest. Meanwhile, efforts to future-proof the M1's armament were coming in handy. The Soviet Union was known to be deploying the new main battle tank, the beautiful T-80. US intelligence believed that the T-80, like modern tanks such as the M1 and Leopard 2, had shifted away from an all-steel armor to mixed composite matrix that included ceramic armors. The result was really improved with the composite armor protection. The T-80 had a frontal turret protection of 500mm of RHA, and the frontal hull protection of 450mm of RHA. The 105mm gun had finally run its course as an effective armament for most main battle tanks of the day. Improved M1A1 tanks equipped with the larger 120mm gun began rolling off assembly lines in 1985. The 1991 Persian Gulf War against Iraq saw the M829A1 depleted uranium round used by M1A1s against T-72s with devastating effect. Nicknamed the Silver Bullet, the round could penetrate an estimated 570mm at 2,000m, 
giving it a fairly good penetration even against the T80 at typical ranges. Amazingly, the M829A1 has a flat laser-like trajectory out to 3,600 meters, meaning it does not incur any ballistic drop due to gravity over a distance of 2 miles. That gives one idea of the pure power behind the 120mm gun with this kind of ammunition. The latest generation of the M829 series round, known as the M829E4, is designed to penetrate even further than previous versions, the exact extent of which is classified, and to defeat active protection systems such as those built on the latest Russian tanks. Whether or not the M82E4 can penetrate the armour of the Russian new T14 Armada tank is pretty much unknown. The US Army has not pushed the arm to the M1 with a longer gun barrel to increase muzzle velocity or a larger diameter gun since the Armata's introduction, an interesting non-development in the face of this new tank threat. Despite this ammunition's attention to obvious controversy, the round is really not all that new. The military has experimented with it for a very, very long time. It's a lot less denser than its cousin tungsten. Uranium can penetrate nearly all heavy armour types, but whereas tungsten projectiles become rounded at the tip upon impact, uranium shells burn away at the edges. This self-sharpening helps them bore into armour. Something that is also highly attracted to the military is depleted uranium's abundance. Depleted uranium is a byproduct of the process by which uranium-235 is created. It's the most radioactive and most useful form of uranium isolated from natural mineral ores. In 1998, the US Department of Energy had about 500,000 metric tons of depleted uranium in storage. Depleted uranium armored piercing incendiary, or API, munitions come in two main forms. One is fired from the suitably named Tank Buster, A-10 Thunderbolt aircraft, and the other shoots from the beautiful M1 Abrams, which is also enforced with the DU armor. Both types of API munitions total 300 tons were used during the Gulf War, but only A-10s were used during the Operation Allied Force in Yugoslavia. According to a statement by NATO Secretary General Lord Robinson, some 31,000 rounds of DU ammunition were used throughout Kosovo during the 11 weeks of Operation Allied Force. Each round of A-10DU ammunition contains around a 300 gram DU penetrating slug, which brings a total amount of depleted uranium dropped during the conflict to a little less than 10 metric tons. Interestingly, normal uranium is not as hard as tungsten, but as a classified technique allows it to be hardened, it produces this amazing ammunition to be used on tanks. This is believed to involve alloying it with titanium and cooling it so that it forms a single large metallic crystal rather than a chaotic mass of tiny crystals. This structure is extremely strong and produces an improvement similar to that of the difference between a brittle pencil lead and a carbon fiber tennis racket. The final advantage of uranium really is though the cost. Machine tungsten is extremely expensive, but government supply of DU is more or less free. It is likely the DU ammunition will eventually be phased out, but not for health reasons or controversy that you're thinking of, more for the military ones. It was introduced to solve the problem of breaking through heavy armor but tank armour is concentrated mainly at the front, facing the main threat. It is thinner on the sides and thinner still on top. If the entire vehicle were clad in thick armour, it would be extremely heavy to move. That's the point that we're kind of hitting on today. It's almost like trying to make a microprocessor even faster and faster every day. Eventually, we will be limited to the physics of a vehicle and the physics of the ammunition. We just can't make enough armour to stop these things, to make it thick enough, and to make an engine powerful enough to move these things around. Instead of the brute force, the clever approach would really be to attack the weakest point, which, as we already know, is either the rear or the top of the vehicle. You know where I'm going with this, guys. Anti-tank missiles are normally starting to come into the spotlight a lot heavier than these kind of ammunitions, and I'm not saying that these are redundant. I'm saying in the near future, we may see different kinds of technology coming out that may phase out DU type of ammunition. Overall, the service record of this type of ammunition is very impressive. We know it's capable of defeating most modern armors today, and especially with the types of guns being used to fire them, they can do a hell of a lot of damage to most tanks today. The US military using DU does have the severe controversy behind it, and of course it's going to be probably a bit of a reason as to why they may no longer want to use it. But the reality is that technology is advancing at an extremely high pace, and that conventional munitions may change very, very much in the near future. Folks, I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about DU penetrators today, 
And if you do have any comments or concerns about today's video, please leave them in the comment section below. I'd love to hear your opinion on this type of weapon system. If you wish to follow my channel, uh, please feel free to hit the little bell button by the subscribe button. If you want to support my channel, then I would really appreciate you going to check out my Patreon page. Anyone who's been donating towards my Patreon page really can't thank you enough for doing so. It really, really does mean a lot to me. And thank you all for being here today. Have a wonderful one. All the best. Bye-bye.